Uh, it, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague from the Department of Cognitive Science of Rensselaer Polytechnic, May C, who uh, has worked in many areas related to conversational agents and also studies of emotion because, you know, she has the pedigree from what is now Institute of Creative Technologies at University of Southern California. And she will tell you all you have to know about virtual humans and interactive storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah all of this is in the interest of not taking too much time from her presentation. That's why it's so short. So thanks, Sergey. And I want to thank everyone, the organizer, and everyone to give me this chance to introduce myself and my research work. As Sergey mentioned, I work at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I'm in the Department of Cognitive Science and also I'm part of the Game Simulation Arts and Science program. So most of my research life have been spent on creating virtual characters, dialogue agents, and interactive stories. So I try to map some of my projects on the 2D plan that I can present. So roughly speaking, if you look at this artifact, you can see that you're modeling things ranging from uh, embodied. That means they have a, either a digital body, uh, such as all of those 3D, 2D virtual simulations, or they may have a physical body, such as the, uh, the robots, the room, not the Roomba, uh, the turtle bot, uh, the Baxter robots, or the Xeno robot, that they have a physical body. And range, the other extreme range is the more of the, I guess, the modern NLP, the chatbot that doesn't have any body associated with it. They may sit behind a uh, hardware device, they may sit behind the user interface, but they don't represent, they don't have, a, uh, the interface doesn't really represent those characters' personality or emotions, they don't really do that. And then when study this different sort of like format of agents interacting with human, uh, the research work also, uh, because of their physical embodiment, we also have slightly different emphasis. So for example, uh, again, with dialogue agents without a body, you don't really model, but you also cannot use their nonverbal behaviors to deliver messages, like what is their intention, their emotion and such. Uh, the, 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 the social robots type, they're interesting too. Like once they have a body, it's hard for people to ignore how their physical uh, form and shape try to deliver the message. And sometimes even the artifacts or even just the noise, the robots when they move, that you naive user, <laughs> they also would try to interpret those as a signal. So it's interesting range of research that I have been working with. And today I just want to pick a couple of projects that I think may be interesting to this audience and hopefully that can enable us to have some useful and interesting um, conversations throughout the conference. So before I go too far, like directly jump more into my personal research, I just, just want to quickly mention like this desire or this interest in study this human-like character that's sort of like why we want to study it it's not because now we have deep learning where we used to have planning or scripts it's not be well at least personally i think it starts from this desire not because we have the technology so i'm not sure how many of you have heard about this project the euphonia that was an attempt at 1830 a german in germany that people tried to that's before we even have digital computers the people try to create this a human woman hat and attach it on top of a piano sort of like device. And then they, uh, I mean, I don't have videos of this thing, but only through reading, it, has, it says it has artificial tongue, which is basically my understanding is it try to mimic human conversation, try to mimic the voice through an instrument, just like how piano works. Uh, again, through my reading that I heard it's not super like, realistic and people were freaking out back then. But I just want to mention that this desire comes way before we have a lot of fancy technology. Uh, we just want to duplicate ourselves or explore creating uh, entities like us in this artificial world. And for most of people in, I guess, in computer science and some of us in cognitive science, the first dialogue agent we ever heard of or interact with would be Eliza. So this one was created in 1966. Uh, it's a chatbot. Um, dress it up as a psychiatrist. So we'll ask you recursive questions such as, how do you feel? Why do you feel that way? What do you think has happened? Just like on and on. So it's a very interesting um, 
about in the way that uh, if you look at how simple the code is, of course, I don't have the original code, but I do have the code uh, who remade it uh, around uh, in the 80s. It's like such a short code and it does a lot of conversation in comparison to like not mentioning GPT-3 and such, but just like our own agent. I'm really impressed by how much this bot can do for that for that many lines of, um, of Lisp code, basically. And then as for interactive storytelling, there are many inspirational systems. And uh, one of those, uh, at least one of the early system that being very inf influential is called Tailspin. It was created by James Meehan in 1976. So this system is all about two characters. Uh, it's a planning based system, by the way. It's about two characters. Joe is a bear who lives in a cave and Evelyn is a boar. Well, they can create other stories, but this is one of their uh, most typical story. Um, Everyone is a boar living on the tree, and then they both have needs. They need to eat stuff, they need to not be thirsty, and they have a theory of mind about each other because they need information from each other. Um, so the bear wants to ask the boar where honey is, and for him to do that, he just have this chain of reasoning that the board would be happy with him if he gave the board a gift. And hence, uh, if you see their example stories, you will see the bear just go looking for uh, for warm because the board eat worms and then give it to the board. So in modeling the character's intention and plan, you will see things like when characters uh, make decisions on what they uh, what they would react to the situation. Their models of characters, not personality, but sort of like character property whether they're honest or not they're this uh decisive <laughs> or not and then there's model of characters relationship and that's this liking relationship that's why the bear would try to please the board for getting the information he needs so it's a very early system that has been almost 50 years since it was made but i think in much later work uh, in modeling digital characters and interactive storytelling, a lot of the concepts here are still valid and inspirational. Um, that leads to my own work at, uh, in, in this area. So this is my first work that I did when I was uh, still doing my PhD work around 2000, uh, I think from 2005 to 2010. Um, so this work was a lot in, uh, in spirit, carries a lot of uh, similar idea as you can see in the tailspin system. Uh, so this one is called Cespian. It's uh, it's an authoring framework for developing digital characters and use them for interactive stories. Um, the system basically say, okay, let me just do a two level uh, system. Uh, on the bottom level, I model virtual human uh, using either folk series or cognitive series, one way or the other. I'll try to model those characters so that they have human intention or human like intention, human like emotion, decision making, and such. And on top of that, I want to build a behind the scene director agent that massage everyone's character model a little bit. So all in all, the story goes into the direction that I want the story to go into. At the character level, uh, this one is built computationally. It's built on top of PAMDP, partially observable Markov decision process. But that, that's just the sort of the computational basis. At the function level, as I mentioned, it actually carries out uh, carries on a lot of idea that we have already observed in the tailspin system, such as character need to have a theory of mind about each other. So they need to have mental models, what other people's beliefs, intentions, or emotions are, what their beliefs about me. And then uh, combined with another capacity, which we call look ahead reasoning. So that's basically just like, what, what, what I'm going to do if I do this, what you're going to do in return, so on and so forth. So with this model of this two functionality as the sort of like a foundation, and then we're able to model characters decision making process as a utility, those characters are utility based. So how they make decisions basically to maximize their future utilities. We also model characters emotion as a preso based emotion. So uh, for people who uh, I guess everyone are familiar with it. Appraisal-based emotion is basically how a person reacts to the environment is dependent on a person's evaluation of how other people or how the city, whether the situation is controllable, changeable, and what are other people's motivation in it. Are they, for, for example, if I'm not happy with you, are you purposely setting me up where you're just uh, ignorance? Then I'll have different emotions. 
So that was the uh, idea at the character level of modeling, which is largely based on this two functionality, the theory of mind reasoning and look ahead reasoning. And then uh, the director agent is, as I mentioned, this model, even though uh, this, this character model, this PAMDP based character model, I'm not showing all of the details, but you just have to believe me, it's a model with a lot of parameters. It's not as large as uh, the language models that we're dealing with nowadays, but still has a lot of parameters, which means there are places where you can massage those parameters to achieve the same basically character behaviors. And that's the trick the director agents we built were playing. So it's basically just running a lot of simulations with the current setting of the characters. It also has a simulator for the for the user. And then they just say, okay, what is going to happen in the future? Would that be consistent with the goal that I set up for this story? And if it's not, can I go back and change my character models just a little bit so that they are still going to do the same behavior as what has already happened so far? <laughs> and then they would, the subtle change in their uh, character model in their parameter space would also lead them to do new behaviors, what I want them to do. So it's just like, because of this huge space of uh, character um, parameter space, it's basically just doing this tweak of parameter job. Um, so, so that's one of my, I guess, my first attempt at modeling uh, digital characters and story. And at this moment, I just want to bring this discussion up a little bit to the level of when we look at interactive experience, or when people who are not computer scientists, writers writing such novels or movie scripts, like the different ways of how people do it. Of course, one way is what we call character centric, which is basically, like I said, using either cognitive theories or sometimes people just use folk psychology theories to form a model of your character. And then you put your character into different situations, introduce them to each other, and then their interaction would uh, become the experience. So the Sesame system that I worked on uh, even though I do care about the plot, but most of the effort were spent on modeling characters. In the other sort of prevailing way of view, looking at story authoring or story writing is this plot centric, uh, which is basically let's focus on study what kind of sequence of events would create a satisfying entertainment experience. So a lot of theories are in this direction. So uh, Aristotle's tension curve, the hero's journey, and or a lot of times for everyone's um, uh, application, you may just have a storyboard that you defined for what should happen at what moment to satisfy my goal. So as I mentioned, my earlier, uh, my first work on interactive storytelling was more of a character centric. And later on, I do try it a lot in this uh, plot centric approach. And typically when I do this, I was, for me, the plots are not just for entertainment alone. Typically they carry some utility. <laughs> so I'll give you an example. So one of this work was building a storyteller uh, in the virtual world for a language teaching uh, scenario. In this case, we're trying to teach people Mandarin Chinese. And then there are virtual characters here, and then they will try to tell stories to the user, to the player. The player as a foreign language learner doesn't have a whole lot of uh, thing to say, but, but the learner can ask questions and make short comments on the story. And then the agent's role, uh, were, we have two agents, but the storytelling agent's job is mostly how can I, based on my understanding of the player's interests or the player's inputs that uh, he or she has given me so far, how can I massage? It also does this future look ahead reasoning. How can I decide what kind of, the story itself wouldn't change too much because it's a known story, but I can certainly weight in different amount of details on different topics. So how can I massage those details in at different moments of the story so that all in all the story still follows? whatever the original story is, but also now I can take care of the user's interest. Um, so the in user interest profile, we're just basically modeling it as a large vector. And then we use uh, sort of like a mixed Gaussian estimation on like how much the user is interested in each of this. Now, once we have that, uh, we do look ahead reasoning to add those factors in. 
Um, lately, uh, so, so lately, I've also tried to do this, again, using storytelling, but uh, slightly spin it to a, a different direction. Uh, I've been tried a lot on data storytelling. <laughs> so the idea goes with um, now just with all of the development of technology, there are just huge amount of data everywhere. So how do people consume data and how can we have a narrative agent or a dialogue agent that can help you in this data exploration process? Can they facilitate people in certain way? Why don't we just show people the charts, right? What can a narrative agent do in this situation? Um, the idea goes with, we definitely, it goes a little bit further with like what narratology means and what, how sort of like narrative is linked to um, uh, how human cognition is basically constructed. So we basically believe um, we, because we human are very used to getting information through narrative, through dialogue. So a lot of times how we organize information are also consistent with how uh, basically just causal and temporal relationship in narrative a lot of times we also organize our uh, experience and our memories internally that way so instead of showing the player the user a bunch of isolated information points uh, or charts we're trying to say can we organize them into for example multiple storylines can we use some of the uh, storytelling techniques such as foreshadow or tie back we're making contrasts we're making analogies can we do those for describing information so that we can emphasize things from the data and we can help people remember things better because the narrative technology is sort of uh, they are by default to help you remember things. They're gonna keep on asking you, do you remember this and that? This is similar to what we have talked about before, where this is in fact different from what we have talked about before. So uh, with this idea in mind, we've tried to do this with both semantical data. Uh, the semantical data means the, the information are mostly just text. So one of the application we did in this, um, uh, in this direction, it's trying to build a sort of like a history, a multimodal uh, presentation, but also you can talk with human uh, about the history of our own campus. Actually, we collaborated with our library for doing that. So basically what we did was uh, we get this archival information from the library uh, with library staff and other sort of like unstructured document. And then we convert those into knowledge graph and from the knowledge graph, now we construct narrative thread to present this information to the human, to the user. And then on the other end, we also build an interface, graphical interface that shows just, and then, I mean, the interface is designed, but it's basically reactive to the narrative agent. It's just a multimodal interface that shows different aspect of the data. So in this particular case, we have the, um, uh, we have the campus map on the left, so you know like where um, we talk about the particular building on campus, where this building is, and where it was in the history. So you just have, you want to have a map there. And then um, middle are just a bunch of information we thought are useful, such as who's involved, a major event happened at this location and such. And then to the right, we just display more images and relevant information. Um, so as a way to help people um, look through, flipping through the, um, the, the information. Um, <clears throat> at least from our own, own experience, we felt like that's better than flipping through the archival pages. Uh, we've also tried to do this with numerical data. Uh, we've tried several different types of numerical data. And here, the ideas are very similar. Uh, we still want to build narrative and highlight the contrast or similarity um, uh, in the data trend. Um, but of course, this work involves a little bit of additional work in actually uh, the numerical data, you have to interpret them a little bit. The semantic data, we just sort of understand. Um, here, we want to interpret a little bit and actually find out whether uh, we do a little bit of pattern analysis and find out what is the trend here, whether this is a sharp, uh, sharp drop of the price or not. So we build this like um, a little bit of pattern recognizer first, and then we just embed them into a narrative storyline generation system that mentions these patterns when interacting with the user. 
Uh, so that's like large data because large this work was partially motivated with the um, sort of with the move of large data and there are so much data that um, we interact with and we can consume on everyday basis. Um, so from there, from there, from the idea of I want to build a narrative agent to present data to people, we, want, we went forward uh, in another more recent project, which is ongoing at the moment. We want to move forward and study uh, a, it's actually a task inspired by, uh, uh, by the NLP society, it's called visual storytelling. So basically the idea is if you are uh, given a sequence of images, if you're given just sequence of images, can you write a paragraph about those images? How can you write this paragraph more like a human writing rather than a typical, I guess, a simple, uh, let's say, computer graphics writing? A simple, a simple uh, object detection, for example, if you're giving those three images, uh, a very simple object detection work would say there's a person standing on top of a scooper, a scooter on, in, on the street, and then there's a board on the street, and then there's a scooter laying on the street. So we're trying to say, okay, how can we write better than that? How can we write a sentence uh, uh, more similar to the man jumped off his scooter to avoid hitting that board? How can we write something more similar to that direction? So for doing that, um, we actually try to create a interpret, um, um, interpretation for the information that we can, uh, a computer vision algorithm can detect from those images. We try to make connections among them and add, so inject basically uh, possible intentions behind. So this intention may or may not be true, but we try to find plausible ones that we can insert so that the end result is just like a if you show the three images to a person, what a person would say, so he might be doing this because of that. Um, the idea for, for doing this is basically, again, um, go back to when we do storytelling uh, or what our understanding of human cognition and narrative, um, people don't just see isolated information, rather they see relationships among things, they see uh, actions having results, and they were trying to uh, inject intention and people's emotional reaction into those scenarios. So we try to do this with a computational system. So then the system can really link the information they can see in those individual images. And then from there, that's the system sort of like, we call that sense making uh, because it mimic human sense making process by incorporating new information into existing knowledge about the stimuli. Uh, but really, um, it boils down to how can I make connections between what we can detect in those images and how can I make hypotheses that are consistent uh, with each other. Um, the consistency is part of where it comes from, um, like human, when we interpret things, we try to, typically we try to reach a cognitive consistency uh, rather than just like more hypotheses we want those things can, um, um, in, reinterpret itself. So in this case, for example, uh, if you just run a, a scene graph parser, uh, it's basically a vision system. You can get this very basic information saying, here's a man uh, on, in front of a wheel. That's the wheel. The man has a car uh, behind him. That man has pent and so on and so forth. There's a board in front of a sidewalk. So you can detect all of this individual knowledge uh, and then what we try to do here for the for the computer system to interpret the situation and make reasonable hypotheses and linking this thing together are really uh, we form hypotheses about uh, which one are identical uh, objects throughout those images. So, for example, we would assume the street is the same street. That's how the story can continue. We would also assume this um, scooter is the same scooter. That's assumption to make the story continue. Whether it is the same scooter or not, um, um, it depends. But um, but the narrative itself, uh, the, the, so this process of integrating information just goes with uh, um, 
there's a threshold actually we consider the physical similarity but on top, on top of that if we say that those two objects are the same objects would that make more information get connected with each other can i connect this network into a more tighter sort of like um um network of information rather than scattered piece of information can i do that uh, similarly we want to add a potential causal relationship into this interpretation like why people do that um why the person uh, sort of get out, out of the scooter because he see the board so that's just one possible interpretation if there are if it's not con uh, in confliction with other hypotheses then we'll keep it there so this work the at the computational level is actually a uh, once you form the hypothesis it becomes a multi-hypothesis optimization at least computationally that becomes that for us so how can we satisfy more sorry more hypothesis and have a larger consistent hypothesis space as much as possible and we use that as our basically that's our belief of now the system is making sense of more of this information and we know that there's still a very long way to go from from here to human sense making but hopefully, uh, we're, uh, at least at this moment with this computational work, we can say something that is more consistent, uh, uh, not isolated about individual image, we can say something that is more describing their difference for the trend of the event. Uh, <laughs> so um, we do, we have a lot of projects now that I went through so many, I realized there are many things that I want to mention. Um, so. Then, so the previous project was still on how can I interpret the, um, um, basically interpret the data or interpret the image. And then as time moves on, approaching 2020, <laughs> or in the past few years, right, like deep learning is really everywhere. So now we try to uh, also try to use deep learning, machine learning as a tool to help us construct dialogue agent. So one of the uh, one of such work we try to work on is to create a persuasion agent um, based on this data set called persuasion for good. So this data set is basically a collection of human human dialogue that one person is trying to persuade another person to donate to a charity. So uh, in human dialogue, there are strategies and there are stages of conversation that we human all understand at least better than the machines but when you're looking at if you're just looking at the data those are just piece of dialogue <laughs> a lot of piece of dialogues they don't really tell you what strategy uh, the human used or what the human's intentions throughout those dialogues are so what we try to do is uh, rediscover those strategy actually because we use machine learning it's hard to say whether they're actually strategy but we definitely try to re rediscover those dialogue stages using um uh, using machine learning and then when we build our dialogue agent we give that rediscover stages we call that progression function so once we rediscover those stages uh, we can ask our agent to lead user to go through those stages in the dialogue. So hopefully that leads to a positive conversational result. Um, so for this, for this, like uh, as you see in our diagram, how do we get this? We call that dialogue state, but it, those are really just stages through dialogue. Um, that's a little bit of computational work. We try to use uh, both unsupervised and supervised clustering technique. So basically, based on what people see uh, said in those dialogue and what are the outcome of the dialogue, we can run this cl different clustering algorithm. The end result from the clustering algorithms are just like, I can roughly divide all of the dialogue into seven clusters or so, they're relatively stable. And I can, I would be able to know like in most of the successful dialogue, which stage follows which. So then if you give me a new dialogue, I can sort of map out how you're moving in this um, clustering space or what we say a dialogue state space, like how you're moving in here. Of course, the dialogue agent itself, it's trying to lead people to a successful uh, end. So people who will donate to the charity. So for doing that, uh, here we invoke this, uh, uh, this function called rollout. This rollout, I think is just a machine learning communities term, but it's 
as far as I understand, it's very much the same as the forward projection or the look ahead that tail's been used or even set's been used. It's basically just saying, okay, at any moment of the time, let me project possible alternative routes of dialogue into the future. It, it does have to simulate to the user, but if I do this, the user will do that, then I will do this, the user will do that. So I just have this branching tree of simulation. And then by the end, uh, it's very similar as any other utility-based agent. Uh, once I do the simulation, I would know the, 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 the outcome of the simulation. And then I would just pick the outcome that has highest utility by the end. Highest utility again here, it's just like how much, whether the person is going to donate or how much uh, he or she is going to donate. So of course, with this rollout or with the look ahead, some of the general property is the longer you do the rollout, the better. Because if you only do it for one step, then you may, by may be caught by this local optimal point. So the longer, the better. Of course, the longer, the more computationally expensive it will be. And also, if your model is not that accurate, longer rollout by itself wouldn't, wouldn't help you too much. Um, so now leads to, I'm not sure how am I doing on time. I try to talk really fast throughout the process, but now it leads to one of my current projects. And I think it's, uh, it's also uh, the last one I want to introduce. I think it goes very much into the fun part of can we use uh, all of the recent development of technology, the large language model, and also what is being really popular, the text to image. We heard about this different uh, diffusion model, the, the, the um, um, Del E, the, there are different models for generate image. So here we just want to put all of these factors together and do a project where uh, we have a uh, language generation. Uh, basically, it's a modification of language model. But we want to have this language generation uh, agent that can collaborate with a human user in creating this graphic storybook. So here we assume the user uh, will just, uh, so, the, so the thing is, by the end of the day, you want to have both images and sentences. Uh, somehow we just believe the user are not good painters. So the user collaborate with the system on the narrative side, and the system will invoke additional process for generating the image. Um, and then we want to give the user some control over the content. So for example, uh, uh, so here we showed one of the um, uh, partial stories. Um, so the uh, story says, um, the image is a little bit small, but he put a potato in the oven and they cooked for an hour, and now user would have the option of saying, okay, I want the later story to be, to be join and trust, to be just happy, and then later on also have a happy ending, and then this would bias the system into generating things such as he put it out, he ate it for dinner, a very simple story in comparison to like novels and such, um, uh, but still you, you get the idea. Or if alternatively, the user wants to say, okay, I want the later story to go into someone will feel anger, disgust, or, uh, or sad, then you will see the story moves into direction like suddenly he smelled it burning and afterwards he ruined his dinner. So inside, how do we do this? Uh, inside, we just basically have um, two pipelines for doing this. One is majorly a lar uh, large language model fine-tuned by different data sets. Uh, basically, one side is the text generation pipeline. It just, it's capable of taking keywords. You just give a number of keywords. You have to mention potato, you have to mention a beach or whatever, and you give an emotional tone of the, uh, of the next sentence. And then based on those, uh, the story, uh, this text generation pipeline, which is just a fine-tuned language model, um, can generate a sentence that's consistent with those. And then we also invoke this visual stories. Uh, so we invoke a, some of the diffusion models. We tried both disco diffusion and stable diffusion for this purpose. So then, uh, so this one would generate alternative images accompany each of the sentences that you have in the, in the, in the story you've generated. And then the user can pick a, a, a pick a picture to, um, or pick a sentence to proceed. And then we don't want the picture to be sort of like a byproduct of the story. So then we also invoke a object detection algorithm. You just use, some, we, we just use something very classical like YOLO or fast RCNN. 
it allows us to extract the objects from the image. And then we can uh, tell the user when the user is about to write the next segment of the story, we can tell the user, now that the image contains some objects you have not mentioned yet, whether you want to mention them or not is the user's choice, but uh, we want to present those as a, uh, as a option. So uh, this thing does has an interactive uh, uh, demo, but I figured I wouldn't be able to present it. So here are just two other stories we're able to create with the, uh, with the system. Um, so the left side is someone uh, go to the beach with some uh, collecting shelves and the shelf, uh, in, indeed the shelf has um, um, there's something inside the shelf and bite his leg. Uh, to the right is someone who's trying to write a book. So, so this one we found it just as a, as I mentioned, it's a fun exercise of putting this new technology that all gets popular and gets available in this age and how we put them together um, to, um, to create um, storybooks. So that, <laughs> that leads to my last slide. Thanks so much for sitting here and listening to my talk and listening uh, to my story. Um, if you ever wonder like where this clip arts come, come from and why I put them there, they were all computer generated. <laughs> all those three were generated with the prompts for thanks for listening to my story. So my research journey is sort of my story. And then those two are generated with cognitive system research. And I found it to be interesting that um, they highlight the front lobe. But I mean, they generate a lot of images for me, but none of them sort of highlight the emotional limbic system. So maybe the large data still need to be calibrated more to appreciate the role of emotion. Uh, but anyhow, here's the true end of my talk. And see if you have any questions. Very interesting. But been quite a long time since I've heard somebody mention Meehan and Tailspin. So um, I think Cenk's work and uh, Meehan was a student of his, you know, would have looked a little bit differently at the generation of that uh, story. And, and looking at the last one, there's an expectation failure there. You see somebody riding and you don't expect to see it fall over later. And then you need to explain that. To explain it, you look back at, and connect it with the bird. And so that also relates to, he had a theory of interestingness, what makes something interesting and um, conflict or expectation failures were part of it. Do you have a theory of interestingness that is part of how you generate stories? I have a lot of these point theories here and there a little bit. So some of the intuitive part it's hard to summarize my thoughts. I think it's merging in novelty without um, merging in novelty in a, not in a totally unexpected way. It's sort of like expected creativity within the space. So something you are not ex consciously expecting, but also plausible. I think that is part of interesting, not necessarily all, but that's more of my interpretation of maybe more of creativity than interesting. Interesting may cover more, but, but not random, but not expected. A combination is something that intrigues me a lot. So um, have, have you heard of the Kuleshov effect? The what effect? The Kuleshov effect. So Kuleshov is a Russian filmmaker and um, uh, did studies on recording actors with abstract expressions, but then mixing those with uh, other, other shots, right? Like a food and then an expression, the same expression right next to like a ballerina, right? And then ask people what emotion uh, this actor was expressing, same shot. Uh, and, and of course, that context um, changed, right? So given your uh, earlier work on emotion, connecting it back to some of your later work in uh, story generation, um, as well as that example of the of the bird and then the scooter, um, how, how do you think that 
sort of the emotional appraisal model actually feeds into your hypothesis generation of stories and so on? Um, I think there are, I can provide answers conceptually and theoretically or practically. I, I think the conceptual answer may be more interesting. I think the, now that I recognize that effect, I actually, um, I think I know it. I think that theoretically says we need, I need to have a much better user model to understand the user's context and then to anticipate user's anticipation. And then based on that, that, that would bias interpretation of not only just my facial expression, but that that can bias my interpretation of the verbal expression, even if it's just text-based ambiguity is always there. Um, how do I do that accurate user model? I don't have a good answer. Uh, practically, uh, practically, I guess the answer is much less interesting, but we've tried a lot of work in um, um, prompting the language model into giving the actors or characters emotion and intention so we just try to tune the language model so that it can answer questions of what the car uh, what you you're feeling at the moment it's not that it wouldn't reach any level of what cognitive scientists can do so the practical answer is less interesting but uh, but we're trying on the uh, bird scooter story um, you had get to a spot where you have graphs that you want to combine various nodes uh, I'm wondering um, what criteria you use to, um, to gather nodes together and whether that would break down if it was a larger story. Mm, in the larger story, we have never tried. Uh, so it's a co-reference problem. Right, the co-reference uh, co uh, uh, problem we're dealing with, uh, at this moment, it doesn't go beyond five images. Uh, so I'm not sure how it's going to generalize to more. I don't know. But basically here, uh, there are the, the hypotheses are supported by evidence, the evidence including physical evidence. Because once you have object detection, it gives you some similarity score. So that's one type of evidence. And then it goes with um, some of the hypotheses are just naturally uh, conflicting with each other. So if you have two streets, you cannot if in this case I have two streets, I cannot say street one is both the same as street two and the same street as street three. You cannot have those. And some of the motivational uh, 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 motivational link has similar, so both the identity and the motivational link has similar properties. You, I cannot do this both because I'm happy and I'm sad. So then um, I think I only mentioned briefly, so basically the hypothesis once they're generated, they support different amount of evidence, uh, both from the physical image and also from support from each other. By the end of the day, it's just a giant uh, multi-objective optimization. We try to uh, optimize just mathematically how large, uh, how, many, uh, how many links we can uh, create in this large network. So our intuit intuition says the more connected things are, that's sort of like our algorithm knows the interpretation or whatever, making sense of more of the information. So we try to, con uh, we, we try to connect more nodes uh, in that way computationally. Also, uh, the process actually also generates nodes because we generate objects and beliefs behind the scene you cannot directly observe. So we also prefer a network that is larger to incorporate those things. And then with those two objectives, uh, then we just try to accom accommodate as many or as much of the hypothesis as possible when they're not conflicting with each other. Great. So there's, a, there's also a question on, uh, on Slack from Lucian. How is coherence ensured and evaluated? In which application? <laughs> So, so basically, as I do these different projects, I, I find my definition or my understanding about many fundamental clarify. Oh, shift throughout. Maybe not. Um, so this one, the coherence is basically just the included hypothesis don't conflict with each other. But whether that's narratively coherent, that's another story, I do realize. So he clarified an images to story generation. 
oh, this one, uh, this one, we don't have a very good way to ensure coherence. It's basically just relying on a modern language model. Um, just like uh, you use GPT, right? There's an AI dungeon, there's a game that, that the language model is able to generate. So it has some capacity to, to, to generate coherent story. And we are not in charge of that. Let's thank our, oh wait, we got one. Hello? Oh, okay, perfect. Um, so uh, in the diagram here, it says user involved creation. <clears throat> And maybe I missed it if you had a slide about it, but what does the collaborative process look like and what sort of strategies did you employ to make sure that um, like uh, they converge on some sort of optimal solution? Like what does that collaborative process look like in the way that you've envisioned it? So this collaboration actually doesn't necessarily lead to a good story. <laughs> the user do have a lot of control over the content, the emotion, basically whatever the user wants. The system try to create a sentence that satisfies those needs. Uh, a little bit of collaboration comes from the system can, if the user's ever short of idea of what I want to say next, the system can suggest keywords, events, sentence, and emotion, like everything that a user may need um, to continue. And that is typically consistent because we tuned the language model through other stories. So that's typically reasonable within a five sentence story uh, range. Longer than that, um, it probably wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> so hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> well, the system also try to recognize the objects from the images, I guess, as a way of reminding the user your story shouldn't, shouldn't just about the text, that whatever people see also matters, but it's only work on that level. Okay, great. Let's thank our speaker.